So uh, this is another Asian Movie Pulse Reviews. I'm here with director Mayu Nakamura. Uh, her film, She Is Me, I Am Her, is showing at uh, Japan Society New York as part of the Female Gaze, uh, which is focusing on women filmmakers from Japan Cuts and Beyond. Uh, the feature is an anthology following the lives of different women, each living in COVID-era Japan. Um, so just to begin with, could you tell me a little bit about how the project came about? Okay, so it's a collection of four short films, like omnibus feature film. So the first off I shot among four of us, that was shot uh, early, well, it was like shot in early July in 2020, just after the first lockdown in Tokyo. So it was like a real lockdown, like nobody was going anywhere. Everybody was kind of stuck at home. So I wanted to sort of portray this period, you know, like this COVID time is something that everybody in the world experienced. <laughs> and nothing like this ever happened in my life or probably won't happen in my lifetime, I hope. <laughs> yeah. So... Uh, me and my actors came up with this idea of doing some short film since like all these good actors and good you know good crew people are, like had nothing to do so I decided to do something and uh, at the time there were several like short films like this where people had this like a zoom short film like this like people having a drinking session of a zoom and mm. I wanted to do something similar or something in that vein but I thought this kind of a format was a bit restricting like mm. you know it's hard to watch people drinking on this screen <laughs> for half hour so you know we kind of tried to do it like we had with me and my actors tried to rehearse over the zoom but it was really hard so we decided to do it in a park in the outside like open air so and then we decided to kind of change the whole setting in the park and and the, so the first film among four of us was shot outside in the park in like july 2020 mm. and that film did pretty well it got some award at the osaka, osaka asian film festival in 2021 and it went to japan cuts but you know as you know with a short film you can't really do much so I got some government grant last year. And so we decided to do the sequel, sort of like a follow-up, um, portraying like a, a woman surviving, you know, in the time of COVID. So that was sort of how this whole thing came about. Yeah. Uh, was it because of the Among Four of Us short film to begin with that you decided to follow it up with a collection of short films in order to mm -hmm. pad it out to a feature yeah yeah that that i mean with just short by itself you can't really screen so mm. and i thought the idea of you know collection of short films would like portraying the you know women of different ages living in this time might be quite interesting and and one of the other idea that we had was uh, Nahana, the, who plays the main character. She's sort of almost ageless in a good way. <laughs> she kind of looks like in her 20s or maybe 30s or 40s. So she could kind of play women of different age groups. So in the first film, she played like a, a housewife in her 30s and the second one like office lady like working from home mm -hmm. and you know a sex worker in her 20s so everything's like she plays like a different woman of different age groups yeah. some people said like we didn't notice it was the same actress until like a third or fourth film <laughs> right. she looks very different well no I mean obviously Nahana features prominently in all of the film's episode and in mm -hmm. my opinion she's fantastic in all of them and like mm. you said she really does slip into those roles uh, mm -hmm. can you tell me about how she sort of came to be in the films in the first place and what your working relationship is like with her um so when i did the first film among four of us um i wanted to work with those two actresses the Susako urabe who's also in the world of fortune and fantasy 
and she's a fantastic actress, and so is Nahana. So we wanted to, I wanted to work with, with them, so I came up with this story. And then there was this like a government grant that happened, yeah, you know, yes, uh, last year. And uh, a producer said, like, can you do some uh, feature film with the Nahanas? I mean, actress. So I thought, well, maybe I could do the, the, the sequel, of the shorts. Mm. So how it, so, you know, and, and I kind of uh, thought, because she looked kind of ageless <laughs> and she could slip into those characters, that that's sort of her, you know, attractiveness. You know, like uh, ability as an actor to be able to kind of slip into different characters is something that I can kind of uh, take advantage of. Yeah. You mentioned before as well uh, how each of the episodes have women mm-hmm. of different age groups, sort of ranging from mm-hmm. young characters like the sex worker, ranging mm-hmm. to the sort of office worker working mm-hmm. from home. How important mm-hmm. is it for you to feature women? Of different age groups specifically older women in your films oh okay because i think i said in other interviews but i did uh, a psychological thriller called intimate stranger yeah uh prior to this film yeah which features a middle-aged woman looking for her teenage son and i don't know about other asian films but in japan it's hard to cast a middle-aged woman or woman over 35 as the main character. Like it's usually young woman, young men, and middle-aged men and <laughs> middle-aged women kind of neglected. And yeah. um, so that it was my one of my quests or mission to, to make a film <laughs> with women over 35. Um, so that was kind of, main idea like trying to make a film you know about women who are a little older that who are not usually featured in Japanese film no do you feel that because uh older women so say the woman in someone to watch over me the second episode Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. do you think because characters of that age aren't as prominent in Japanese films do you feel like there are some stories that are missing like crucial stories that are missing. Um, yeah, I think so. I think so. Because uh, uh, as you know, the Japan ranks like 123rd in the gender <laughs> equality ranking, which kind of means that, you know, women are valued for their age and for their look. You know, ageism and lookism is so, you know, strong here. Mm. So, which I kind of, you know, I feel like there's, there's so many good stories are missing just because they only value young women and, and objectify young women as like sex objects and feels like a lot of things are kind of missing by doing that. No. Well, obviously that, what you've just said there with the uh, ageism mm-hmm. and the uh, women being kind of viewed as sex objects, that's mm-hmm. obviously something that features very prominently in Miss Ghost. Mm-hmm. where you've got the older uh, former actress who's now mm-hmm. living mm-hmm. on the street and the younger mm-hmm. tried to be actress. Can you tell me a bit mm-hmm. more about how that particular short came about and how the story for that came about for you? Actually, the, the particular story is inspired by a true event. I don't know if you heard about this uh, 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 a homeless, like 65-year-old uh, homeless lady who was beaten to death at, on the, at the bus stop. No, I didn't. Took place in in November two thousand twenty, oh. and it it created this like outcry among women, like saying she is me, and it's kind of that whole slogan kind mm. of inspired the title of this film because no. you identify yourself with every woman in the film, and actually there was another male director, very famous one did this uh, another feature film on that story as well so it it was a kind of a scandalous like a a very sensational uh real crime that happened and everybody was shocked because i think a lot of women identified with this particular woman is because 
a lot of the women in Japan work as freelancer and uh, or part-time worker, which means that you don't have any job security. And a lot of women lost their jobs during time of COVID. And so every, a lot of women identified with her, like saying, you know, feeling like, you know, they might lose their job and, and end up on the street. No. So that's I why I did that story. And even those two women who are in a different background, different age groups, they both had the similar ambition. And uh, actually the woman that, the actual woman that who was killed, you know, came to Tokyo wanting to be an Anastasia actress. But she kind of lost her way mm. and she lost her job because of the COVID. That's why she ended up on the street. No. And the other woman is sort of has a similar ambition, but she kind of also got sidetracked and ended up like working as a sex worker. Uh, and, you know, she talks about how she's kind of prepared, not prepared, but, you know, even if she gets killed somewhere that she's ready for it almost like that's a story that I actually heard from a young sex worker I do like a very thorough uh, a documentaristic research because I'm a documentarist as well of course yeah so I, I, I did a yeah I did a research with a young sex worker and heard her story as well and and yeah even a young woman you know if they had no place to go they might not end up on the street but they might end up in some strange man's place and get rape and whatnot and then so both of them are very powerless in some ways but they find salvation is or, or solace in just you know meeting one night at the bus stop no no i mean it's, it's a very beautiful short just in that way and, mm -hmm. and one mm -hmm. of the aspects of it that kind of grabbed me was how intimate their interaction is mm -hmm. um we keep sort of mentioning covid just in the background it's a little bit mm -hmm. like in the film itself that it, it's just kind of hanging over all of these shorts um mm -hmm. how much did the how much did your personal experiences during the pandemic kind of influence uh any of the episodes in the film if at all Oh, okay. Well, as I said earlier, because I am made also made a lot of documentaries, when COVID happened, like, I wanted to do something. I wanted to portray the whole experience in the film because it's something that's shared globally. Like, everybody could relate to it, like how people mm. felt isolated and, you know, look back on their lives because he, you're stuck at home <laughs> so that's kind of experience that everybody could share and relate to you know it globally and as a woman that you you know a lot of women became lost their jobs and got became powerless so that's something i wanted to portray but also i didn't want to make like a really desperate sad story i wanted to sort of incorporate some fantasy into it Especially mm. like the third story, you know, the, the Miss Ghost story is uh, sort of, I tr try to make it like a fantasy in some ways that they kind of meet at this bus stop for one night and find this salvation. But, you know, I also have them like play this Chekhov piece, which is almost unreal. <laughs> you mm. know, it's like no. this bus stop becomes like a stage. So, and also the second story, the delivery story, is also a bit of a fable in a way that it mm. actually was inspired by, you know, this whole delivery, uh, meal delivery service became so like popular in Japan for some reason. You know, the Uber car service is not really popular here, <laughs> but uh, Uber meal delivery is still very popular. And most del delivery, you know, are done by men. And I heard some stories about, you know, some men who, you know, developed some crush on some female customer and slipped on some like love notes saying like, let's go out for a drink or something. <laughs> so um, I, I heard that story and I thought that was a little bit scary. Yeah. Because like, they, they know where you live and they could, 
you know, do something. And so I kind of try to come up with a story of Uber delivery boat, you know, like a delivery service guy. And and I kind of imagined what if an anorexic woman <laughs> ordered the food to sort of satisfy her own desire. Mm. So they have their own agenda, like a secret agenda. <laughs> So it's kind of based on somewhat like a real story in some ways, like a real I- event, but I kind of elaborated it and then made it into sort of, a, I'll say like a modern fable, <laughs> yeah. <or> urban fable. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, authenticity seems very important to you and your stories mm-hmm. in terms of doing the research for it. Mm-hmm. Um, on that, mm-hmm. d- there seems to be while there are these very kind of nice intimate moments in all of the Mm -hmm. episodes Mm -hmm. and these sort of relationships that you wouldn't expect Mm -hmm. there's a distinct sort of lack of intimacy surrounding those moments so for example Mm -hmm. the conversation that they're having in uh among four of us is this very significant Mm -hmm. and important conversation but they're Mm -hmm. obviously so far away from one another um Mm -hmm. do you find generally that in a post-covid world or coming close to a post-covid world there is a this lack of intimacy between people or do you find that people are actually more aware of others and caring in that way oh i think it's a very difficult time and not like europe or us where it's almost like the covid's not it's kind of over nobody's wearing masks Mm. over here everything everybody's still like wearing yeah. masks religiously almost oh, okay so um it's still not over yet for us here <laughs> so i think I- interaction with people is still a little bit difficult and it's very isolating and you know it's something that i wanted to sort of you know portray is you know the the very final story about the blind woman and living as a blind person you rely so much on hearing and touching mm. and touching is such a, a almost like a, a dangerous act in the time of covid or, or, or leap of faith almost like if you're allowing somebody to touch you mm. because it's like you're carrying germs potentially <laughs> so that something kind of interests me like it kind of isolates people but at the same time it you know, this COVID made us aware more of, you know, how valuable it is to be connected with someone and to be able to touch someone. It's almost like actual faith. You know, you have to really trust them. Yeah. So it, it's, yeah, it's very interesting, I think. It kind of made you think, like, you know, what it means to be connected with someone and be close to someone. Yeah. No, and that's definitely something that's prominent throughout mm-hmm. all of the episodes is sort mm-hmm. of these small intimate interactions um mm-hmm. on covid from a production point of view obviously mm-hmm. you said you made uh, among four of us in july of uh, 2020 did you mm-hmm. have any production issues with the rest of the shorts uh just uh... in terms of the practicalities of getting them made during the pandemic oh okay um well of course you have to keep you know sort of stick to the protocols of like getting temperature i mean the same deal with the other feature film that i did which was you know intimate strangers which we showed it over 10 days but um this short was relatively you know short on a very you know limited days like Mm. i think each one was like one day two days and three days max Wow. So luckily, nobody was infected, or because <laughs> little the long feature film got you know stopped in the middle because somebody is infected, and they had to like reschedule. But that thing kind of thing didn't happen for us in production wise. But you know you have to be really careful about you know not getting infected, otherwise everything will stop. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah, that that's uh, something that you have to worry about but we're kind of used to it now i think yeah no unfortunately yeah mm-hmm. um out of all of the episodes in mm-hmm. the 
film. Are there any that you would explore further from a thematic point of view or a narrative point of view? Was there any one in particular that you, oh. you'd like to go into further? Like a develop another story, you mean? Just just in any capacity, yeah. Was there anyone oh. that sort of grabbed you the most? Mm -hmm. It's interesting because, uh, you know, because I did a lot of research with the subject matter and especially with the sex worker. I heard so many stories from her that, you know, just made me realize that I, don't, I didn't know anything about. And the sex workers and cops and yakuza are often portrayed in the film but mm. it's you know most people like really don't do any research and i had sort of prejudice or stereotype about sex worker but it's like she could be any other woman that i know like she looked mm. like a really regular person but you know she had this job and she the woman that i interviewed wanted to be a um, voiceover act actress for an anime. Okay. She worked in a maid cafe, you know, those like, a, you know, the maid cafe, like no. <laughs> they, they dress up in those like dresses and serve men. And, but she couldn't make ends meet and she started doing the sex work, but, you know, she, her real ambition is to be, do this, become this voiceover actress. So most people, do it for the sake of making money but you know the stuff she told me about like stories that she told me was very dark that you know I was like god this is not a movie material <laughs> no well not as as a documentarian uh is mm -hmm. that something that would interest you in the future not even just that aspect of it but anything sort of related to uh, the pandemic or even a post-pandemic world is is that a sort of documentary project that you'd be ever be interested in um yes and it's it's hard to not do it in the documentary in a way because these stories like a lot of times that you know people don't want to show their faces no it's hard to shoot so in a way fiction serves better because then you can dramatize the whole thing of course yeah so, yeah, but there, there, there's always something to be learned from documentary research. But one thing that I find is about sex work that was kind of interesting was that I interviewed her in the summer of, oh, actually last year, last summer. And a lot of uh, uh, Shinjuku and Shibuya, like bars and restaurants are closed because of like the, the government, like enforced them to close it. Mm. So everything was like closed so I was like not sure if this sex work business is still like really operating <laughs> yeah but she told me like what well, the customers didn't decrease actually they had more customers so she said like well sex worker the prostitution will never die <laughs> in even in the time of uh, COVID yeah, no, that, that was kind of a uh, interesting maxim <laughs> to hear. Yeah, no, that's quite eye opening to be honest. Yeah, so the people who kind of order those services are not afraid of COVID, of course. No. Yeah. So, yeah, it never dies. <laughs> yeah, no, that definitely says something about some sort of deeper need, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, I mean, obviously, you've already had. Intimate Stranger, as you said, mm -hmm. premiere earlier this year. Mm -hmm. uh, you've just had this movie come out as well. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you have any immediate projects lined up for the future? Oh, okay. So She's Me and I'm Her is coming out in theatre at Shibuya Eurospace in November 26th. So that's happening in a few weeks. And I also have a documentary project. Uh, I did this uh, documentary called Alone in Fukushima. It's yes. about I don't know if you heard about this film, but I basically made a documentary about this guy who remained in nuclear zone in Fukushima with the animals. And that was released, I think it was like seven years ago. And I actually made a sequel. I, I kept, you know, I, I followed him for last eight years and I made a sequel and uh, that film's going to be released in February. 
okay. uh, image forum in Shibuya. So I'm also preparing that release as well. Yeah. Have you sort of finished up with that or are you still in the editing process? Oh, no, it's already finished. Okay. I'm just preparing for like, you know, all this like publicity stuff. Oh, fantastic. So, yeah, right now I'm like doing both fiction and documentary. But yeah. in the future, I'd like to make a film in the US. <laughs> yeah. Because I have a green card and everything. So, but documentaries have always been something that I always loved and you know research wise it's always been very helpful like you know because I've done a lot of documentaries I know how to do research and that always served me uh, very well for fiction as well yeah would you say that you're more comfortable do obviously I would imagine you're more comfortable doing documentaries, but do you feel you're finding your feet a bit more with fiction or do you already sort of feel comfortable in that space? Um, I like both. And I now want to do more fiction because my original background, like I studied filmmaking at NYU and mm -hmm. mainly it was in fiction. And I thought, you know, my first feature was fiction for Summer of Stickleback. So my real love not real love but like my my first love is really fiction okay the documentaries is something that i kind of stumbled upon because i had to make ends meet and you know it was something that i kind of started for a living but i came to love it so i still want to do both but i now want to more do more fiction because that's something that i've been wanting to do for long time yeah. well no I, I think it's fantastic that you're dipping into yeah. both fields either way because it means that we get mm. the best of both worlds so yeah I think there are more filmmakers now who do this kind of thing like you know people who do like both like documentaries and fiction mm. so the boundaries kind of disappear I think yeah no definitely um yeah so did you have any sort of final messages just on the film itself or anything you wanted oh, to say going okay. forward um yeah i like to have this film hopefully released in theater or online platform somewhere uh, you know overseas like in the future and uh, but yeah i was wondering like if this is film is getting dated because covid is something that's kind of over for most you know, people in the Western world, I just came back from LA and nobody was wearing masks and it seemed like the COVID is something of the past. But so, yeah, but it's something to be remembered, even if it's over, you know, it was a very, very specific kind of experience that everybody had. So no. I think, you know, there are a lot, lot of things that, you know, people can get out of this film. No. Definitely. And uh, like you said, even though in, in some parts of the world, sort of the obviously lockdowns and stuff and the mask wearing is kind of over, mm. I can only speak for myself, but I do feel that a lot of people will be able to relate to the mm. experiences in the film. Mm -hmm. Even if they're not happening right now, they're definitely something that everyone will, if not experience themselves, other people that they know. And I, I do think there's a lot of uh, merit mm. in what the film has to say. And it kind of yeah. very deftly portrays um, some quite challenging situations for people living in a pandemic. So, yeah. And I actually, I kind of uh, appreciate that Japan society did this kind of series about female gays, yeah. which is, I wish they would do something like this in Japan, <laughs> you know, kind of featuring on women and women filmmakers is not something that happens a lot here. Yeah. So I hope they will, you know, will have something like this in Japan as well. <laughs> do, you, do you feel just briefly, do you feel yeah. that with some of the, um, sort of changes and outcry that have happened within the Japanese film industry within the last mm -hmm. year. Can oh, yes. you see some kind of focus on female directors and female filmmaking in the future, this kind of uh, project or season, if you like? I think industry has changed somewhat that they are very more careful about 
you know, exploiting other people and not to exploit other people. No. Um, but still, I think, you know, the people who have money, you know, sponsors and investors and basically middle-aged men. <laughs> so so their, their tastes kind of dictate the selection of which films to be made. So there's a certainly a glass ceiling, I feel, even though we have more female directors, people putting money in the film is actually more, you know, mostly men. So mm. they, they taste kind of dictate the film. But hopefully that would change, <laughs> that we have more female producers and executive producers and that hopefully would change. Yeah. Well, I mean... Like I said, I think these are four examples of stories that are very much worth telling and mm -hmm. worth hearing and from perspectives that you might not always find. So I think, mm -hmm. you know, as, as long as sort of good filmmaking and stories comes out of things like this, I, th I think there's mm -hmm. every chance and, and there should be. Yeah. Right. So That's this right. was Mayu Nakamura. Uh, her film, She Is Me, I Am Her, is showing as part of, Japan Society New York's The Female Gaze and um, be sure to check it out if you get the chance. Thank you.